Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. I have an excellent topic for you today. Joining me is Candace Delacona from Offit and Kerf- Kerfman? Kerman. Kerman, yeah. Kerman. Oh, I was close. <laughs> and we are discussing financial elder abuse, what to watch out for, how to protect our loved ones from it. And unfortunately, I'm sure Candace can confirm, this is a bigger problem than most people would like to then we'd like to admit. So thanks for joining me, Candace. Oh, my pleasure, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. And most of my guests are either current or past caregivers or in the industry. I don't know if we want to call it industry, but are in the, you know, caregiver support niche. Do you have any background with dementia or Alzheimer's or any of those lovely (laughs) diseases? You know, I do. I've been a lawyer here in New York City for 20 years, and my area of concentration has always been elder care planning. Um, And so by virtue of the fact that my area of specialty deals with planning and the protection of elderly, as well as their access to benefits and programs, unfortunately, elder abuse, particularly financial elder abuse, has become a big part of my practice. And We've seen sort of a, a very significant uptake, uptick in the numbers of elder abuse from a financial perspective, especially after COVID. Um, there, there are a couple of reasons why we think that that's happening. The elder law bar here in New York City, across our state and across the country, um, have seen sort of similar increases in those numbers. Most people don't realize that one in 10 vulnerable adults are abused. One in 10, uh, which is really significant. And of those people, only one in 44 is reported. Basically, what that tells us is that it happens often and it barely is reported. And sadly, you know, what we see is that a lot of the abuse, at least half, Um, It seems that the perpetrators are those in the family, right? The family unit. Uh, So not everyone in the family, um, but certainly within sort of the family unit. And and I think that is partly owed to the fact that that's why it's not reported. And that's why it's so common, right? So the major factors of those who are being abused are memory impairment, So dementia, Alzheimer's, as you point out, some types of Parkinson's and other diseases of the aged, as we like to call it, Uh, social isolation, right, which Mm -hmm. we've seen a significant amount of in the era of COVID and the months and years that have followed. Um, And then, of course, the third major factor is when you become a senior, you tend to rely on others for assistance with your activities of daily living. So you're sort of vulnerable by the, by the, just by the mere fact that you need other people to help you. Um, so what I always tell families, and I have a number of cases, is, you know, it's not so much that you can predict predatory behavior by the person, the predator. Okay. You should really look for the signs in the, in the elderly person, him or herself. Right. That's what I was just going to ask you. What are the signs we should, what are the common warning signs of financial elder abuse? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, you know, the sort of telltale signs are, you know, certainly confinement of the, of the senior. And, and what that means is, you know, we're seeing, I have two cases right now with second spouses. Um, and okay. the second spouse has isolated the, the loved one. In my case, both husbands. Um, and the new spouse, the wife, has sort of confined her husband um, and the interpersonal dealings with friends and other loved ones and kids from from the first marriage. Um, and that confinement uh, leads to, obviously, dependence on that person um, so that the the person who's being abused is even more dependent on that person because it's possible that 
the relationships with the people on the outside um, as a result have suffered, right? Um, mm-hmm. And because of that, you know, you tend to have the ability maybe to take advantage a little more um, in terms of, you know, the the confinement, it's limitation in social activities too, right? So if your dad was always going out to meet his buddies for a cup of coffee on Tuesdays at the local Dunkin' Donuts, and all of a sudden he's not attending it anymore, you might want to ask why, right? Um, okay. So the withdrawal from social activities. The other thing um, is depression, because even with seniors who have memory impairment um, and perhaps are not the most alert, let's say, um, they feel sad when they're withdrawn from, you know, their loved ones and the social interaction that bring them joy and happiness and uh, activity. Um, So certainly look at depression. If there is anxiety, kind of same thing, change in sleep patterns, Um, you know, so those types of things. And unfortunately, in in one of my current cases, it was alertness. It turns out that the spouse was drugging her spouse um, to keep him (laughs) tired and home and, you know, so that the manipulation could continue. So I would certainly look at those signs, um, you know, as, as maybe something to look further into. And then in terms of, you know, what do you do, right? Yeah. (laughs) Number one, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. If you're, if you're a child, an adult child, and you see a change in your mom or dad, ask the person who's providing the care, whether it be the spouse or the girlfriend or even a home care attendant or a neighbor or a trusted friend, what's going on? Why is this happening? You know, it does two things. A, you're advocating for the person. And B, you're telling the possible perpetrator that there are eyes on them and that you're recognizing these changes and that the behavior won't go unchecked. Um, you know, sometimes and oftentimes these issues as a as an adult child or as just an advocate, as a friend, as an next door neighbor, you say, I, I'm not really sure, but you should engage professionals. And okay. the, one of the first people that I recommend my clients talk to is a geriatric care manager. Okay. And I'm sure you've (laughs) spoken with geriatric care managers before. Yeah. They're very, very busy, but very beneficial. Yes. Professionals to work with. Yes. Um, So just for our audience who may not know what a geriatric care manager is, they're sort of a jack of all trades that can help either guide the senior citizen, him or herself or the family in a number of things. They can assess the elderly person, figure out how to make them comfortable in their own home. They can look into a situation if we think that things are amiss, if there's an abusive situation, if there's a neglect situation. They can advocate with doctors if the loved ones live further away. They can make sure that they get to the doctor's appointments. They can do all sorts of things. They're almost like a social worker for the senior citizen. And they're that makes trained. Sense. Yeah, and they're trained in behavioral health with finan- with family dynamics and as well as diseases of the aged. That makes sense. I have a yes. friend, well, my husband has a friend whose sister-in-law has early onset Alzheimer's. And her, I don't know if it was, I think it was the brother and sister-in-law. They basically, what was it they did? They, they took out a second mortgages on her properties in Southern California And we all know that uh, properties in Southern California are oh so cheap, right? (laughs) And they basically cleaned out all the all of her equity and her safety net, financial safety net. And one of the biggest problems with that family, because I talked to the brother-in-law, who of course you know is kind of one step removed. You don't really couldn't really insist on specific things, and his wife was very reluctant to, you know, point the finger, call out behavior like, hey, what's going on? We kind of suspect this. And it took them probably eight months before they, they, you know, took over. And unfortunately, you know, the money's gone. And this woman is like my age. She's going to need care for a long time. And it's just, you know, I don't. So 
They're in the San Francisco Bay Area. This particular part of the family is in the Southern California area. I'm not sure what it was that triggered their concern, but is so you think going to a geriatric care manager was should have been their first step? That's a really, you know, unfortunately, really common scenario. Like California, New York has very high property values. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of predatory people recognize that. And there is a way to get gain access to equity just in the way that you described. And what your friend talked about feeling really uncomfortable and almost, you know, you're almost embarrassed that you don't want to sort of accuse anyone, especially if they're not doing anything wrong. And I think that that hesitation is completely normal. Um, but in terms of, you know, what they should have done, I mean, obviously, we have the benefit of hindsight, right? Right. And, and yeah. so I would never judge somebody, you know, at, at the time doing the best that they thought that they could. But yes, the first step probably would have been to get a geriatric care manager involved. The other thing I would absolutely do, if that were me, is I would make contact with my loved one's physician and really assess their level of capacity so that you are not maybe overstepping if the person does know what they want and does want to gift money away or whatever the case is where you're not sort of interfering. Um, and then, of course, I would talk to the elderly person, him or herself, um, about what's going on. Um, I think that it does two things. It puts them on notice. Um, and it also informs you as to whether or not you think they have the capacity to understand what's transpired. Um, and if it's if it's certainly not too late, then you bring your elderly loved one to an elder care attorney in your local area to make sure that the elderly person, him or herself, is the one that gets to choose, A, where their assets go, and B, who's in charge when they no longer have the mentally mental capacity to make those decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your friend being in that situation, I mean, certainly it's really hard to thwart a criminal enterprise because that's really what you just described. It's a criminal enterprise. Yeah, they were right? pretty they were pretty good about it. <laughs> they they were top notch thieves essentially. And it's family. Like that's that's the hardest part because it's like you don't want to you don't want to believe family's doing this. You don't want to accuse somebody in case you're mistaken. I mean just there's like a lot of emotions tied up in that and I understand that. Of but course. I of think course. if they if they had could benefit from like the knowledge that I have, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So knowing that, you know, this woman's going to need care for a very long time. And we know care is expensive and takes a lot of our time and our resources. You know, they might have been a little less hesitant, but yeah, it's not a cool situation at all. <laughs> It's like, well, you know, I think I think that begs the question too, right? When do you speak up and how do you speak up? And and that might also be why the geriatric care manager is helpful because they're a neutral third party and they can ask the questions and then they don't have to celebrate Thanksgiving with everyone, right? So <laughs> that's a good be point. The person that's sort of asking these uncomfortable questions in the same way I play that role as the elder care attorney, where if 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 a family comes into me and it's two adult kids with their dad or their mom. The first thing I do is I remove the kids from the room and I talk to the mom or the dad alone. I want to understand A, what their capacity is and B, if they're there on their own free will and they understand and they want all of this to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And and so bringing in those neutral third parties like a geriatric care manager or the lawyer, you don't, you know, we, that's our job to be nervy. Uh, <laughs> so family members don't necessarily have to do that. You know, with respect to... You know, your friend, though, I, I was on the phone with a client um, who, you know, this really remarkable woman, only child, um, daughter of, of, of her dad. And they had just such a very sweet relationship. And he had this long term girlfriend, um, believe it or not, also in her 80s. He was in his early 90s. Ooh. And she was doing exactly what your friend was doing. Like, I feel terrible. but this doesn't seem right to me. However, I've known this woman for a very long time. Like I feel very uncomfortable. And what I said to her was, well, let's reverse it. Let's pretend that it's your dad looking out for you. And your dad wants to have a conversation with your husband to say, what's going on? 
you know, how would you feel about that if you reverse the roles? And and that sort of gave her almost the courage to have that uncomfortable conversation, you know, to call a spade a spade, as they say, and really just move ahead. And what we found out with this woman was she was drugging her father with yeah. Benadryl, having him sleep all day. Um, he was big on Facebook. He was in his 90s. She unfriended all of his friends on Facebook. So he had almost no interaction. And because of COVID, uh, the daughter wasn't in the apartment for quite some time because she was a university uh, professor and didn't want to infect her dad. So she would visit with him outside. And by the time she made it into her father's apartment, again, somebody who has memory impairment, everything personal was gone from his apartment. Mm. The girlfriend threw everything out, which as you know, somebody who loved somebody with memory impairment, you don't throw away everything familiar. You don't throw away pictures or anything that feels like home to them. That's a whole level of abuse in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but it was very disorienting to him. Oh, that just, that gives me, oh, just the thought of the, all the personal items gone is just creepy as heck. And yes. I was, I want to back up one step. So when you talk to somebody, an older adult who may or may not have a cognitive impairment. Like my mom was really good at BSing doctors. And I love my mom's neurologist because my mom's neurologist, she must have almost had like two brains because she would talk to my mom and all of her focus would be on my mom. But I could mutter the correct answers, not necessarily under my breath, but quietly. And she... I could tell she was, you know, it was almost like when the cat ears turned towards you, you could know that they're listening. And, but her general physician, her, the general physician she'd had for years and years left the practice was one of the multi doctor practices. And we ended up with a very nice younger um, doctor, but he did not have enough experience with people like my mom because he'd say, Oh, well, how are you feeling? And, And she would give all the proper answers. Oh, I'm fine. I don't really know why I'm here. You know, she's just worried about me. And he'd say, well, who is this? And and she was really good at tap dancing around answers that she didn't have. She thought I was her best friend, which, you know, could be worse. Um, but that was, that was not my role in our relationship. <laughs> and I never was really sure if he was listening to her and what she was giving as answers or if he would was also listening to me when I would say, no, we're here because blah, blah, blah. No, she's not fine. We're here. But you're like, trust me, I did not take my mom to the doctor just for fun because it was not fun. Right. (laughs) So when they're in your office, I mean, they, there's a, there's a very, there's a period of time in the early and moderate stages where they are very, very good at being sociable and seemingly normal. So how do you get around that are you just informed that the family says yeah they've got a cognitive impairment and then you can kind of assess it or i'm just curious that's a really great question and you know there isn't a a, a perfect answer i'll tell you it's a case by case basis and one of the things as an elder law attorney that we do is when we talk to a client we test for things like not tests, that's probably too strong a word, but we inquire to things like time and place orientation, right? Where there are ways that you can have discussions that are timely about what's going on in the news um, or what the weather is that really can't be faked. Um, And so it's a combination of things. We also speak with the neurologist uh, for the for the client, if if the situation arises, um, and we take whatever data that a social worker might provide or a geriatric care manager, um, capacity level is interesting in New York because you know a person in New York and in other states can generally still draft an estate planning document if they know the object of their bounty, the person that they love. So you don't necessarily have to know that it's 2023 to be able to say who you love. So you could sign a will saying, I love this person and this is why and explain it. Whereas a power of attorney, for example, you'd think the opposite, but the power of attorney, which is the document that works during a person's life, may have a higher level of capacity requirement 
because the powers that are included in it are more complicated. And the person is supposed to understand the powers they're giving to their power of attorney in order to sign the document, which is a higher level of capacity than a will. That makes so, sense. It's interesting, know, though. Your question, yeah. So it, so it really does depend the reason why someone's coming into my office, what the family dynamics are. You know, I, I have clients married to each other for 60 years, two kids, no other kids. Everybody gets along. In that circumstance, if somebody comes in and they want a will that leaves everything to the spouse and then everything equally to the two kids, you know, I'll probably think about that a little more as opposed to I had a client that came in, second marriage, the wife was doing all the talking, the wife was telling me how terrible the children were for the first mar- from the first marriage and trying to sort of maneuver, let's say. I definitely approach that situation with a little more skepticism than I would with the first example where they're married 65 years, two kids, no other, you know, competing interests. So it really does depend. That makes sense. And it sounds like a general physician because it's it's a really common situation where you know, you're dealing with repetitive questions or anxiety or any of the ways dementias manifest and you take your loved one to the doctor because you're about to choke them because they're pacing and asking you the same question every two minutes and you you've hit you've hit the end of your rope the knot is unraveling and they're just like absolutely lovely to the doctor and the doctor's like I, I don't understand what you're talking about the, and the doctor suspects that you are you know that you're nuts or you're misstating it or you know you're the problem, not that your loved one's got an issue. So maybe they should be asking simple questions like, oh, hey, you know, it's good to see you today. Um, I got to write this. Can you tell me what the date is? And just pretending it's like asking it randomly, because that would have really helped. And I'm always it's looking what? for ways of helping everybody help each other, because, you know, we know that doctors only have, you know, a few minutes with each patient. And, You know, like I said, my mom was really good at tap dancing around answers she didn't have. And this was in later stages. Um, Yeah. It's really a challenge. No, you bring up a really good point. Yeah. And I think, too, I think one of the things that would probably be helpful to family members, especially to make sure that they're not um, more vulnerable to, to, you know, any sort of financial abuse is to have the right caregivers, sort of a team in place, right? Um, And you have a physician that may not be the family physician that's always been. I mean, it could be because maybe that physician knows the person well enough. Um, But there are circumstances where it's a big practice and it's a rotating shift of general practicing doctors, and they may not have that intricate knowledge of memory impairment and what sundowner syndrome looks like, for example. So you bring the person to the doctor later in the day as opposed to in the morning because you know that the confusion increases in the afternoon. Um, or that you bring them to a specific geriatric neurologist or a ge- geriatric psychiatrist, right? That have that subspecialty. Um, and there are things called, you, you may have gone through it with your mom, but mini mental exams where they're yep. almost <laughs> scored, right? And so oh, yeah, she, a mini she mental- flunked that one spectacularly because we had, um, and I don't understand how this happens in this day and age. I mean, I do, but I don't. Like they had none of her like previous MRIs because when my after my dad passed away, I had to kind of start all over. Mostly, I was starting because m- my dad didn't accept help from me, and it wasn't discussed. I mean, we knew what was going on because my mom was the third generation with a cognitive impairment, so it was not like our first rodeo. But yeah. after he died, it was like, uh, holy Toledo, how do I take care of this one? How? Do I engage with her properly? So I had to kind of start from square one. We had to do everything all over. They had no record of her MRIs. So we had to do all the memory tests and the MRIs and everything. And I th- I think it was the neurologist. She said, oh, so your mom refused to do the test, the mini mental exam. And I said, oh, no, she did it. Sort of. I mean, she didn't have any of the answers. You know, draw the clock. What animal is this? All those that we, you know, you probably see online a lot. Yeah, no, she flunked. She had a zero that one. (laughs) Flunked it with flying colors. But this was literally like three years before she passed away. So she was definitely in late stage. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. 
these ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, but what you talk about, Jennifer, is advocacy. Like that whole role is advocacy, right? And so when you when you think about the uncomfortable role that your friend was in, if you maybe change the frame of the dialogue and say, I'm just acting as an advocate for my parent. I just want to make sure they're okay. If the person who is possibly predatory has a problem with that, then you have your answer. Um, But if you have someone who's acting as an advocate and making sure that the medical tests are done and making sure that all of the finances are in order or that the mortgage is paid or that the bills are paid and everyone's sort of working together, it's hard to take offense to that. So I think that acting as an advocate in the way that you did by having to reinvent the wheel and start all those medical tests all over again, it's the same thing with finances. Um, you know, and it's wanting to make sure that you're shoring up the finances for the elderly person. So the money is there to take care of them. Yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> and my mom was um, in memory yeah. care, so I can attest to the, the expense of caregiving. <laughs> Absolutely true. I mean, you know, and in, in what you have to think of, too, is that the predatory actions can come from anyone, unfortunately, um, you know, family members included, especially looking at that statistics that we mentioned at the at the very start, which is half the predatory actors in that scenario are spouses and adult children, right? Um, and so it's really important that you know who has close contact with your elderly loved one um, and what their strengths are too. I mean, part of it could also be just not doing a great job with record keeping and not doing a great job in managing finances. You know, there are plenty of of larger families that, you know, one daughter is really good at the care advocacy, as you seem to have been, and one may be terrible balancing a checkbook. And so (laughs) if checks are going to be balanced, that probably shouldn't be the person managing the assets or acting as the power of attorney. That makes sense. I was my mom's healthcare power of attorney. My sister and I were both trustees of the estate, right? which always infuriated me because when we were kids, we'd get a dollar allowance. My sister would immediately spend between a dollar ten and a dollar twenty five. And I, this is, this is like a household joke. I am super frugal. Just, that is just like super DNA, super frugal <laughs> drives my husband insane. And it, it bothered me that my dad did that. Cause I'm like, you know, she's terrible with money. Now, fortunately, we didn't have terrible, you know, any spe- any serious issues. Um, you know, there was occasionally we buy stuff for mom. You also pick up some stuff for the kids or yourself or whatever. And I know that's not technically kosher, but mm-hmm. it wasn't like, you know, anybody was spending hundreds of dollars on anything. So, but I learned after the fact that we were supposed to be keeping records <laughs> after my mom passed away. So thankfully, my sister and I just dissolved the estate, sold the home, split the fun funds and went our separate ways. But yeah, I didn't know that I was supposed to keep records and inform people of things. <laughs> like her, her, yeah, her I mean, siblings. I, that's a, Oops. Sorry. Yeah, Throw yeah. my water bottle around. <laughs> you know, and it's like nobody, inf- you know, like when you've got a, you know, like my dad did everything and I don't even know if he knew some of these questions, you know, what, that some of these things were important. Like he should have kept my sister and I up to date better. Um, but it was just, 
this is like, I've learned so much because of this podcast that I wish I'd learned when my mom was earlier in the de disease and before she passed away. But one of the questions I wanted mm -hmm. to ask is that how, how can you, so you suspect that maybe something's going on, but how can you ensure that your elderly loved one's financial affairs are being properly managed? Like, you know, like if my sister was doing things she shouldn't have been doing, that would have been a very unpleasant situation because we've never gotten along. So, you know, what, what can families do like kind of in our situation or just, you know, you know that the second wife is handling things and maybe you never were a super fan and you're, you want to ensure that things are going correctly, but you don't have any evidence that it's not. Does that make sense? It does. Um, okay. and that's, and that's the predicament that most people are in. So the first thing you do, obviously, and I'll, I'll, this is obviously very fact specific and can be different in situation to situation. Right. So the first thing, of course, um, is to have a conversation with the person that's managing the finances, um, to find out what they're doing and what their role is and determining if they have been appointed as the financial power of attorney, if they are acting in the scope as the power of attorney. Um, so I think that that's first and foremost, if they are, and there's questions in terms of what they're doing with the documents, um, and maybe there's abuse there. If you are also on the power of attorney, you have the right to ask for records and say, what is going on? The other thing that can be done that we see quite often is you may not be on the power of attorney. The new wife may be primary and you may be backup, but you could certainly put people on notice including reaching out to the local bank where your, your father or your mother is doing his or her banking, reaching out to the financial advisor because they have their own reporting requirements as well. And if you're really convinced that something is amiss, and, and, and that has happened with a number of cases that I am working on, you contact the local authorities. Most local district attorneys have elder abuse units for finances. And absolutely let them know. And, you know, a lot of people, and I understand the hesitation with contacting law enforcement, but just like your friend's situation, once the money is spent, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah, um, it's, it's really gone. hard to get back. So stopping it where it starts is a good option. The other thing that you can do is contact your local adult protective services. Adult protective services in most states have a uh, financial and they have a physical, um, you know, check-in where they want to make sure that the person is being cared for, they're, they're eating properly, they live in clean uh, living conditions, and they will also investigate whether there is, I, I would say, examples of financial abuse. Um, so, you know, really take in the totality of the circumstances. And this is maybe where you bring in the geriatric care manager to pick it, you know, peek into things, you bring in the other professionals, you can talk to the accountant to say, you know, has had there been a lot of withdrawals from mom's IRA? That'll be reflected on a tax return the next year, right? So yeah. things like that. Um, also, banks, believe it or not, nationwide have a know your customer rule where they're really supposed to know who their customer is. So if you have, you know, elderly Mrs. Smith, who has her social security and her pension, and she only wrote out checks for her property taxes and her Con Edison bill, all of a sudden is writing $10,000 checks out, gift, whatever else, that duty is with that bank to investigate. And if you as the adult child also call that bank and say, hey, I'm really worried about this, they must open up a case. The same thing with investment companies. So JP Morgan or TD Bank, wherever you have your brokerage account, they have know your customer rules as well. And they should be able to know when there is an, a senior citizen and they are the account holder, there's an extra level of diligence that they're supposed to have. So it sort of awesome. takes a team, but there are different ways to approach it. True. And I had a um, previous episode where I talked to a financial journalist um, and caregiver for her parents. And one of the things she recommended was go into your parents' local branch and get to know the tellers and the bank, you know, the personal bankers and the branch manager. That way, if you have to do something on their account, 
they they know you. They can trust you. I mean, yes, you obviously have to have the proper f- legal paperwork, but they're not like they're not shutting you out because they don't have a clue who you are and they don't they like what? Why is this person trying to do this? And you're waving around your power of attorney paperwork, and they're like, yeah, we don't care because that's you know kind of normal. So getting, you know, it's like you have to like really be involved in their lives, like get to know their bankers and get to know their doctors and their neighbors. And I think it really is. I think that's excellent advice. And then I I Um, fully agree because we we were very close with our bankers and we were very we were family friends with my parents financial planner. And when my dad ended up in the hospital and my sister and I were like, "Eh, what do we do? You know, we have mom and the dog and dad's in the hospital. And it was like we were like parent focused, relationship focused. My husband, who was a banker for 20 years and is now a um, real estate broker, he w- he went right into who the hell is going to pay bills mode. So he contacted the financial planner. And because we were family friends, he knew it was okay to do things for my parents with like, not my husband's say so, but like my husband would say, ah, this is what's going on. And then the financial planner did things. Was it a completely legal way of handling it? No, but it was what was necessary in that emergency situation. And then after things, you know, my dad was on hospice and then he passed away. Then my sister and I took over because we were no longer in an emergency situation. But yeah, it's, it, it brings me to my, one of my other questions. And I don't, this, that I probably should have sent you this one ahead of time, but what can somebody like myself, okay, I'm 56, cognitively quite fine, at least in my humble opinion. Um, you know, my husband and I have done a trust. We've gone through all the extra questions on what happens if one of us gets Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia just because of my family history. Um, we have one child. We had to, to answer the question, what happens if she dies before we do, which was really a fun question to deal with. Um, but what can you do like in planning your, your golden years, so to speak? Like, how can you, I don't, I'm not sure you can even bulletproof it, but what, what kind of barriers can you kind of erect around your finances to, to help thwart any of the family gold diggers for lack of better term, or, you know, the, the people who like to give to every charity that asks for a donation, like, is there something you could do when you're still of sound mind to kind of help protect yourself? So what you described is exactly what you should be doing. Um, you know, people don't like to talk about death, dying, and incapacity, right? Mm-hmm. Understandable. But I try to sort of flip the switch and, and reframe the dialogue. And I try to make it an exercise of empowerment where it's not other people deciding who's important to you to put them in the roles. It's you deciding. You trust your child. So after your husband, your child is the next agent, not your sister-in-law who, you know, you never got along with, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to sit down with an estate planning attorney while you still have full capacity and make those decisions. Who would speak for me when it comes to my health if I can't articulate my own wishes? Well, my husband, that needs to be in a document. And if your husband can't speak for you, who's the backup? And who's the backup for that person? And the same goes true with finances. You know, you should feel empowered to be the person choosing the ones that you trust the most based on that person's skill set. Just like you described your sister. Maybe your dad didn't make the greatest decision having co-financial agents. But, you know, in his defense, one of the things that my clients often say is, look, I have two kids and I want them to work together. Yep, that was his excuse. (laughs) Yeah, And so, you know, it fosters communication, whereas if one person's doing everything, the other one could feel left out and feel like things aren't as transparent. Um, But I think what you did, Jennifer, in going through that exercise is exactly the best protection you have so that other people don't come upon and prey upon you at a later date because you have the documents in place that already states who you trust and who should be the people making those decisions, whether financial or health decisions. And the way to do that is have it properly documented. And I I did at the time, because we did this in the summer of 2020. So I I did talk on, on various episodes where it's like, there were some questions that were not 
real pleasant. Like, what do we do with our estate if our daughter dies before we do? I'm like, hello, that's not a cool question. You know, and at the time she was not married. She and her fiance or husband, whatever, had been together a long time. And it's amazing how you get into your head and you start like totally analyzing like every little decision there his family has ever made as if like that makes any difference in the end. And, you know, because it was he grew up very uh, financially unstable. And the question was, well, do we just give our estate to him because he's like kind of sort of next in line? And then that's when the whole, well, what if this and his family, that blah, blah, blah. blah. And I finally came to the conclusion, you know, like, I'll be dead. I won't care. And if I got to come back and haunt him because he's making stupid choices with like what was my money, then I'll do that. But it's like amazing how much, you know, like I was stressing over that question. And then it was just like one day it was just like, it won't matter. Like if he makes stupid choices with what was my money after I'm gone, I'm not going to care. At least I don't think I will. And, you know, you just make a decision and, you know, and it's like, you just, it's, it releases a stress. It it does, you know, because I think the unknown and not documenting it, it does continue to sort of spin around in your head. And what I also tell people, I think one of the major hurdles that my clients have um, when they think about the what ifs is how am I going to feel in 20 years? This is what I tell clients. You don't have to know how you're going to feel in 20 years. You just have to know how you're going to feel if you die tomorrow. Because if you don't die tomorrow and your ideas change, we change the document, right? So even that goes to be the the same to be true with guardians for your children. You have a three and a five-year-old. You won't know how your parents will be 10 years from now, but you can change your will to say a different guardian at that time. But if you died tomorrow, Who do you want to speak for you from a financial perspective? Who do you want to inherit from you? And if your ideas about that change, then you just revise the document. So you don't have to know forever. You just have to know tomorrow. And just like you said, at the end of the day, if you love this person and that's who you'd want to benefit if something happened to your daughter, then that's the right decision for you. And your Mm -hmm. decision may not be the lawyer's decision, may not be your next next door neighbor's decision. Every family has a different dynamic. Um, and I think that's the other part that it's really unique to each client. Um, and it's important that you really do soul searching to feel how to think about how you feel because you may have a sister, um, but that may not be the person that you want to appoint as your healthcare proxy. It may be your best friend from kindergarten, <laughs> right? So it does really depend on the specific scenario um, and, and the relationships that you build with, with people and why you trust them. And it does come back to making these decisions ahead of time and having the proper documents in place. And if you don't, then whomever your advocates are, like you were for your mom, have those advocates, you know, make sure to, to all of those advocates in your audience, don't be ashamed to speak up. You'd want someone to speak up for you if you are in a vulnerable position, right? And Mm -hmm. that's really what's important or the most important, not hurting people's feelings. (laughs) That's true. Is there any last bit of advice you want to give people before I let you go save all our older adults from financial abuse? You know what I'll tell you? I'll tell you all those advocates out there, trust your gut. If you think something's wrong, it probably is. Yep. I wish my husband's friend had listened to his, well, I wish his wife had listened to his a little more. And, you know, and it's people like you that are, you know, like helping my audience understand, you know, that it's okay to probe with the family. You know, it's not, I guess I'd rather be mistaken on, I wouldn't say accusing somebody, like accusing my uncle of, doing something with my mom's money, which that wasn't even really an option. But, you know, I'd rather err on the side of trying to make sure my mom was well cared for than trying to preserve somebody's feelings, which is hard because I like my uncle. Exactly right. No, but you're exactly right, Jennifer. I think that the way in which you approach it um, can can really be helpful in that arena where you're just doing the best for your mom and you just want to make sure she's okay. And if you don't have the ability to do it because it's really uncomfortable, then get one of those professionals like a geriatric care manager, the financial advisor, or an elder care attorney to be the bad guy. Yeah, that works. I think we forget about yeah. that that's an option. And so it's 
great that you're bringing that up um, with the friend, with the sister-in-law. I I suggested that they call APS. And I think they finally did, but it was, like I said, like eight months later, which, you know, when it comes to money, eight months is a long time. And now it it's is. too it late. Is. And, you know, because it's early onset Alzheimer's, the sister is in a little bit of denial. She's asking me, well, you know, I've heard about this drug or this treatment. And it's just like, <laughs> it's like, you yeah. need to figure out how you're going to take care of your sister for 20 years. Because yeah. there is no treatments. It's, you know, even though you know, they've just recently announced that the FDA approved a, an early intervention medication for dementias, her sister's beyond that. Even if it was available right this second, it, it's not going to help her sister. So, and that's really hard to tell somebody that it's like, yeah, no, you got you to gotta figure out how you're going to take care of her because that's the only option you have left because that's not a pretty yeah. path. And I, and I think that's important to remember too, when you're having that conversation, that the stakes are really high. Yeah. And so at the risk of hurting somebody's feelings, the stakes are really high and you'd want someone to look out for you. Definitely. Well, yeah. is there, I guess, um, well, I mean, you can't really help somebody that's in California, correct? Cause all the laws are all different. Well, we do have um, offices in California. So Optic Kerman is in California and, and your audience can feel free to email me because I can always connect them to an elder care attorney anywhere in the country. Um, you know, the network of elder care community, the elder care community is, is pretty tight. I think by nature, we all really respect um, and have, have great reverence for seniors. And I think in our own way, um, as attorneys, we're all advocates for seniors having gone into this field. So if any audience member has any questions or they need resources in their local community, I encourage them to reach out to me and I'm happy to do some research for them and figure out who they should speak with in their local community. Well, I appreciate that. And I will put your email in the show notes so that if somebody needs to take advantage of that generous offer, they can do that. I appreciate this conversation because, you know, it's just one more thing we have to advocate for and prepare. Like I said, with us, you know, we, We've done a trust. We've gone through all the steps. It's it's we're getting we're getting close to three years. Probably time to revisit it and double check, make sure everything nothing's really changed. But it's probably smart to to check because <laughs> I'm not I'm I'm like remembering the conversations, but I'm you know am I remembering correctly? A lot has happened in two and a half years. So you know that's the other thing. You can't just do these documents and paperwork and then just file it away for twenty years. You know, and my audience knows my paternal grandmother lived to be 103, so I've got 47 more to go. <laughs> yeah, I Lord hope knows so. what'll That's change for... in that amount of time. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate you for having me. You're welcome, and thank you so much for joining me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>